tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Welcome, dear listener, to Fear from the Heartland. I'm your host, Paul J. McSorley. Set aside some moments now and take an adventurous ride on a journey into the psyche of some talented writers. They will dig into your being and titillate you. Oh, I love that word, titillate. While the stories may not all take place in the heartland, I am delivering them to you from the heartland. My intention is to strike fear and confusion into the mind, soul, and yes, the heart. This is Fear from the Heartland. Hello, Heartlanders, and welcome to Season 5, Episode 22 of Fear from the Heartland. I'm your host, Paul J. McSorley. Hey, Heartlanders, you guys patrons yet? Visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to join the club. You'll get ad-free versions of this and all our other podcasts, including hundreds of standalone releases from our audio archives dating back to 2012. It's a great way to show your support, and you get a whole lot for it. I got into an argument with a friend about whether pens were better than pencils. I'll admit they had a point, but I still think the argument will be erased in time. My friend stole my broken pen, but eventually returned it. That doesn't make it right. A bit nervous about my math exam. I think my chances of passing it are 40-40. I told my teacher, I don't think I deserve zero on this exam. She replied, I agree, but that's the lowest mark I could give you. Brutal. I am proud to tell you, we have a new highly talented author to Fear from the Heartland and two tales by said author, Marcus Demanda. We also have some excellent voice acting assistance from the talented Olivia Steele. Let's get after it. Mercy is a lonely girl, and when her father is brutally murdered in prison and her mother is less than supportive, what options does she have? A pen pal seems to be the answer, until it isn't. And now for your indulgence, Aren't You a Sweetheart by Marcus Demanda. It's my fault. I want that clear from the top. When I tell you that I was lonely, that I needed a friend, I know that doesn't excuse anything. When I tell you this all started when I was 16 years old, it's just background information. When I explain to you that I was brought up by a single mom and that my dad had been in prison since I was five, I'm not calling out for your tears. These are just things it's necessary for you to know. If you don't, none of this will make sense. I need to make sense. I need to keep a clear head. But I'm scared. No, I'm fucking terrified. It's just me and the wide open world now. And him... Trevor Walker, the friend I had needed so badly. My dad sent me a photograph with the only letter I ever received from him while he was in prison. In it, they were standing together, smiling, regular jailhouse buddies. That is, until another prisoner shoved pieces of a broken cafeteria tray into my father's femoral artery and neck. Then Trevor became my friend. 
but he kept being my friend even after I didn't want him anymore. Even after I stopped writing to him. But it seems I grew a brain just a little too late. I took a selfie, printed it off at the library at school, and wrote a letter of my own. This is what it said. December 23rd, 2012. Dear Mr. Walker, My English teacher says the art of letter writing is dead. I want to say she'd be happy with me for doing this, for proving her wrong, but I don't think she'd approve. Neither would Mom. But I don't care. My name is Mercy Evans. That's me in the picture. You knew my dad. Did he ever tell you about me? Mom wouldn't let me visit him. I didn't even know he was in jail until I was ten. I might have never found out if Dad hadn't finally written to me. Lucky thing I was the one who got the mail that day. I can't say I miss him. I hardly remember him. But it's right around Christmas when I miss having a dad. Someone to drive home the tree strapped to the roof of the car. Someone to call me his little girl and threaten my boyfriends. If I had a boyfriend which I don't. But I'm all over the place now. I'm sure you must get lonely there on the inside. Is that really what they call it? I know a thing or two about you. I know you've always said you were innocent of those terrible things everyone says you did. My dad must have believed you, even if no one else does. I'm ready to believe you too. It's hard to make friends when no one understands who you really are which is something I can totally relate to. Everyone at Marshall is, like, on a whole different planet from me. Knowing my luck, you probably won't write back. I just figured, you know, what the hell. Show my mom and Mrs. Madsen a thing or two. If you write back, maybe the art of letter writing is still alive, if only in us. Sincerely, your old friend's little girl. Mercy. I made a copy of that letter by hand and kept it. I copied them all, every single letter I ever wrote to him. I've always been more than a little OCD. I told myself that first time that if Mr. Walker should write back, if he referenced anything I had written to him, I'd want to be able to look back on it. I stole a stamp from my mother's purse. Over the years, this was the least of the things I'd stolen from her. I caught a glimpse of myself in the mirror, though, just as I was doing it. I could not help but feel the inevitable self-loathing that brushed across my face, like a soft hand that had been dunked in liquid guilt. OCD, bipolar, black clothes, and pink hair, and too much eyeliner and eyeshadow, and way too much death metal. Not enough sun, not enough talking with normal people, except for the shrink, and I still think that she never gave a shit. This was me at 16. This was the girl that Trevor Walker answered. And this is what he said. December 31st, 2012. Dear Mercy, aren't you a sweetheart? It's not often that I get mail and your letter arrived just before the new year. It's almost as though fate wanted me to know this is a new beginning for us. Is that creepy? I'm sorry it's not meant to be. Call me sentimental. But I get lonely this time of year. My family disowned me ages ago, so having someone to talk to makes me very happy. So you're Evan's daughter, huh? <laughs> I'll be... Your dad talked about you all the time, said you were the sweetest little thing. Every week, I'd catch him writing to you. From the sound of it, you never got his letters, huh? Your mom must have thrown them out. I'm real sorry you never got them. There's nothing worse than hoping to hear from a loved one and getting nothing. I know that from experience. I know it ain't much, but I'm here for you. I'm sure your pops would have wanted you to have someone to talk to. You have no idea how much it warms my heart to know you believe I'm innocent. 
I know we don't know each other much yet, but when the entire world looks at you like a monster, it feels real good to know there are still kind-hearted people out there like you who believe in me. Thanks for the photo. I'll hang it on my wall. Man, you look so much like your father. Got his eyes for sure. I'm sorry about what happened to him. If you ever need to talk about anything, I'm here for you, okay? Your friend, Trevor Walker. P.S. Please forgive my awful handwriting. I'm afraid it's been a while since I've taken pen to paper. I'm a little rusty. And that was how it all started. Innocent enough, right? Just a fatherless teenage girl trying to connect with, as far as I knew, the only friend that my father ever had, at least while he was in jail. My dad had talked about getting to know wonderful people like Trevor Walker in his letter, and I told myself that this Mr. Walker must be a good man if my father kept his confidence. When I read about Trevor in some old text-only newspaper stories archived on the internet, I noted how he'd always maintained that he wasn't guilty of anything. I convinced myself that you couldn't judge a person by what other people said he did. My own memories of Dad didn't include things like armed robbery and pistol-whipping a convenience store clerk. What little I remembered was him holding me, high over his head and laughing or just looking at me with wide, adoring blue eyes. Not like mother. By the time I was 16, she'd pretty much given up on me and was just waiting out time so she could kick me out of the apartment. If she were here right now, reading this, I'm sure she'd back me up. It was sick of me, and I was done with her. So, the man who claims that he did not kill those women... Well, it was a victim too. That's how I saw it. He was the fourth person ruined by whoever had committed those terrible crimes. I was so glad he had answered me. I wrote him back right away. January 3rd, 2013 Dear Mr. Walker, Happy New Year. I hope that it's okay to say that, considering... Well... You know, don't worry about your handwriting, I've seen worse. I noticed you put your full name at the bottom of your letter, but I'm still saying Mr. unless you give me permission to do otherwise, intent. Your letter was right on time. i just blown my chemistry midterm, and mom took that as her opportunity to confiscate my phone and my iPad and yell at me all afternoon. Sometimes I feel like there's no one left for me in the entire world that I'm shut away in this box with just enough of a window to see how everyone else has a life. It's like you timed your letter to rescue me, or something. Such drama, I know, sorry. Can't help it. I'm so pissed at my mom right now. I wish I could call her out on keeping dad's letters from me. Think I'll play sick tomorrow and try to find them if she didn't throw them away. They're mine, that's all there is to it. I'm trying to work out how the dad I remember could have done the things he was locked up for. I just can't make it stick. Even though mom tells me all the time how guilty he was, I wonder what was going on that he thought he needed the money so badly. And of course, she won't tell me anything about that. Kids at school bring up my dad all the time. Counselors and teachers pry into my personal shit every other day even though I'm already seeing a therapist, one who checks her watch every 10 minutes and labels me a self-fulfilling prophecy. Nice, huh? People. God. I'm sorry for being so mad in this letter. I don't want to scare you off. I'm not always like this. I wish I could meet you in person. Maybe when I'm 18. Please don't be freaked out by that. It's just good to have a friend. Mercy. So, yeah, I really wrote that. Don't worry, though. I won't bother you with every single letter I ever wrote to him. We'll keep it to the essentials beyond this point. I can't do this all night. Time is a factor for me now. Still, 
The second letter I got from Trevor Walker is noteworthy. The thing is... No. Fuck it. I'll let him speak for himself. January 15th, 2013. Dear Mercy, aren't you a sweetheart to rape me again? When I saw the mail clerk stop at my cell, I nearly jumped for joy. I don't have much in ways of entertainment here. I'll take anything to take my thoughts off the cement walls of my tiny prison cell. I guess in that way, we're pretty similar, aren't we? I'm sure of it now. I'm sure fate brought us together. We're both trapped. Both sequestered from the outside world. But just like I have these letters to remind me that I'm not alone, I hope you know that you're not alone either. You have me. I'm sorry about your mom. Some people have sticks so far up their asses, I swear. You deserve better than her bullshit. If I was her, I'd dote on you day and night. Don't you listen to a word she says about your pops either, you got that? He was a good man, a real good man. Always told me he wanted a better life for you. Buy you nice things and move into a big city. If he hadn't passed, I'm sure he would have gotten out of here someday and followed through on those dreams of his. Shit, I don't doubt it for a second. Now don't you worry about scaring me off, okay? I'm touched you're sharing all this with me. I just wish there was more I could do, you know? But I'll always be here to listen. Or rather to read. But if you come visit me, and I would really love that. I haven't had a visitor in years. I'll get to actually listen to your voice. Wouldn't that be great? Mercy, we're friends, you and I. You don't have to call me Mr. or Walker. You can go ahead and call me Trevor. Here's hoping you've got a great year ahead of you. Your friend, Trevor. And so began two years of me referring to this man as Trevor. And that's in spite of the vague, creeping unease I felt of the way he used words like joy and fate. Worse still, when my common sense tried to reassert itself, was his promise that he would have doted on me. I'd invited all of that, of course. Sure I did. I know that now. Hell, I knew it then. I remember how foolish I'd felt, having all but promised to visit him after my 18th birthday. I remember the calendar advancing toward that date like blood water under a door. Slow, but inexorable. And knowing that I would have to keep that promise or somehow back out of it. Nearing the end of my senior year, we had corresponded 31 times, and it wasn't so weird most of the time. Our letters became conversational and familiar. I trusted him with small secrets. For me, Trevor was a source of positive attention, an uncritical adult who told me so many things I really did want to hear, things I needed to hear, about my problems, my life my dead and half-forgotten dad. Speaking to him through the mail was safe, and I'd adopted mail gathering as one of my daily chores. Mom didn't seem to mind. Why would she? It wasn't like dad was going to send me another letter. Incidentally, I never did find the old letters dad had supposedly sent. I was sure that mom must have gotten rid of them, but there wasn't any point in asking. She would deny they'd ever existed, and I'd never know if she was lying or not. Anyway, letter writing always provided that perfect cushion of space. I realized I wanted that cushion. I began to suspect somehow that I needed it. But by the week before my 18th birthday, Trevor had reminded me of the so-called promise I had allegedly made in all three of his most recent letters. And in the last one, he announced that I was officially on his approved visitor list. Staring at that letter, I knew I could not put it off any longer. Decision time, I thought. Do you really want to see this man in person, Mercy? 
thinking clearly for the first time about anything as it related to Trevor Walker. I really did do my best to fix the problem. May 29th, 2015 Hi Trevor. Hope everything is cool with you. I'm sitting by this creek bank in the woods outside the new Glasswick strip mall, using my English binder as a sort of portable desk while I try to write this. I'm crying, and my hands are shaking, so now I guess it'll be you who might complain about the whole handwriting issue. Daddy took me here once, just before it all went to hell. There's crawfish in the water, but other than that, I'm all alone. This is a good place to come when you want to be all alone. I had another fight with mom today, and it was really, really bad. I told her about us. Don't say it. I know it was dumb. I guess I just wanted to open up a little, try to make things right with her in an honest way before going out on my own. Mom said she would help pay my college tuition, so I thought that meant maybe she wanted to make things better too before I was gone for good. But when I told her about the letters, about me wanting to visit you, Trevor, now she says she'll cut me off and just throw me out right away if I do that. And I know she means it. I know I've messed everything up. I hope you'll forgive me, but I, I just can't come and see you. Not until I'm done with college. Please. Please understand. I hope this somehow all makes sense to you. I've explained it the best I can. I'm sorry. Mercy. My best, however, was a lie. Mom wasn't going to pay for my college, although it was true that I might be allowed to hang around at home if I stayed serious about it. You see, I'd actually turned things around in 11th grade. I had decided that the only person who was going to make my life right was me, and I found that, with a bit of effort and a more positive outlook, it wasn't actually that difficult. By 12th grade, I was in the running for a hardship scholarship, and I'd qualified to enroll at the local community college. Part-time work at the student deli would supplement my loans and Pell Grants. I was an honor student. I had even made a few friends. The truth was that I didn't need Trevor anymore. Oh, and I didn't cry while writing that letter either. I did write it by that creek bank, though. Just like I said, I was honest about that much. Trevor didn't waste time in answering. June 8th, 2015. Dear Mercy, Your mother is a damn dirty bitch, and I hope she gets what's coming to her one day. It ain't right to treat such a sweetheart like you that way. It ain't right to make you a liar. Your father always kept his promises, you know? Always. I believe you will, too. I can wait a few more years. I mean, it's not your fault. Hell, I'm not going anywhere. But in the meantime, would you send me a few more pictures? It brings me so much joy to see how you flourished these past couple of years. I keep them on my wall. Look at them every morning when I wake up and every night before I go to bed. You look so much like your father. Got his eyes. If I ever get out of here... Maybe you and I can sit by the water and look at the crawfish together. Would you like that? I would. The only thing that keeps me sane in this godforsaken place is knowing you're out there thinking about me. I need you, Mercy. I need you as much as you need me. Remember that, all right? I don't know what I'd do without you. Your friend, Trevor. I sat on my bed and stared at that letter. By the time I realized what was happening, it was almost too late. I ran out of my bedroom, clutching the letter in the sweaty ball of my clenched right hand, and found I could not let it go until I was leaning safely over the open toilet. I don't think I've ever thrown up so violently in my life. If I had, prior to that moment, still felt that Trevor Walker was innocent of the crimes he was accused of committing that letter set me good and straight. 
For two years, I had been corresponding with a killer. My father had been friends with a killer, and now my entire college experience would be tainted with a mistake I'd begun making when I was 16 years old. I would be on the clock again. It would be ticking down the days until Trevor would be expecting me to visit him, to fuel whatever desperate, despairing, perverted fantasies he used as masturbation fuel on his prison cot at night. He wanted more pictures. He wanted the up-to-date version of what I looked like. He wanted to track my progress toward becoming a woman. I threw up again, noticed my mother at the doorway watching me, saying nothing. I screamed at her to leave me alone. She did, swearing under her breath, something about me being a neurotic little bitch. Later, it would occur to me that the trait was inherited. You know how you always think of that perfect comeback when the moment's long gone? Anyway, I was making too much of this. He was locked up after all. I spit, flushed the toilet, steadied my breathing. What could he really do? The days of me writing letters to Trevor Walker were fucking finished. But Trevor, it turned out, was not finished with me. September 15th, 2015. Dear Mercy, haven't heard from you in a while. The fucking mail clerk must have lost your letter. Don't you just hate when that happens? Or maybe my letter's the one that got lost. Maybe you didn't get my last reply, and you're waiting for me. If so, I'm sorry. I wouldn't leave you waiting like that. I'd never do that to you. I could never be that cruel. I know you wouldn't be that cruel either. I'm all you've got. You're all I've got. Can't wait to hear from you again, sweetheart. Your friend, Trevor. I wasn't too surprised to find this particular letter in the mailbox. Actually, if I was surprised by anything, it was that he took three months to send it. I could see that he suspected the truth. It was all in the way he used the word cruel. He knew what I was doing. Deep down, he knew it, even if he was in denial about it, and he was trying in that slimy way of his to guilt me into writing back. Not gonna happen, Trevor, I thought, sliding this letter into my desk drawer at home. I stared at the pile. I should throw them all away. But I didn't. Nor did I take them to the police and file for a restraining order. The thought of my correspondence with Trevor becoming public was unbearable. The news would have a field day with it. I'd be like those crazy women who wrote letters to Manson or Bundy wanting to marry them. That wasn't going to be me. I was finally getting my shit together. I was in my first week of college, and Mom didn't even talk about throwing me out anymore. Maybe actually seeing me try to make something of myself had something to do with it. Perhaps she was contemplating the empty nest and putting it off as long as she could. I don't know. We still didn't always get along, but somehow, now that either one of us could legally separate herself from the other at a moment's notice, we had found a way to respect each other's boundaries. And I was reluctant to leave. Most of my reasons were financial, there was this other reason, too. She couldn't know about Trevor. Sooner or later, his letters would stop coming. Until they did, I had no choice but to stay. Two months later, he wrote me this. November 20th, 2015. Dear Mercy, You're not ignoring me, are you? I'm starting to think you've forgotten about me about our bond but there's no way we've got too much in common we're friends friends don't leave friends waiting this long it's getting cold here the leaves outside have turned red and brown i wonder what it must look like to you i only get to see the same trees over and over again year after year i know them by heart the ones that turn yellow those that go brown the crimson ones, they're my favorite. Red is such a soothing color. It's the color of life. It's the color of death. 
It's beautiful. How have you been? How's college life? Is that why you haven't answered my mail? Hadn't occurred to me that maybe you moved away to attend class. Maybe your skank of a mother found my letters and threw them out. Burned them, maybe. Wouldn't put it past her. She won't stop us, though. I'll just keep writing and writing until one of my letters gets through to you. I won't abandon you. We're connected. Your friend, Trevor. A message on my phone from one of my co-workers at the deli. Linda, tickets for the Hammerjacks Festival next week. So excited. You're coming on me. Can't cry poor. I ran my hand through my hair, then gripped it in a fist. That was a two-day festival, up where she lived in Fremont, 20 miles away. She'd expect me to spend the night. I'd miss the mail for a day. I texted her back. Can't, sorry. We'll explain tomorrow. I'd think of something by then. I held up Trevor's letter, brushing away tears. Stop it. I whispered as though he could hear me. Please stop it. And that one wasn't the last either. Far from it. For the next couple of weeks, I heard from him practically every other day. I told myself that this was his final frenzy. That this must all end and soon. The words on the page kept whispering to me. Taunting me. Painting my vision red. The color of life and death. We're connected, he said over and over again, and soon it would be our special day. Trevor was conscientious enough to remember it. December 23rd, 2015. Dear Mercy, do you know what today is? It's our anniversary. The anniversary of the first letter you sent me. It's faded now. I've looked at it so many times. Handled it so much that the ink is smeared and faded. But I still have your picture. I'm very careful with your picture. I don't let anything bad happen to it. But back to the topic at hand. Our anniversary. I haven't heard from you in months. But I know you're thinking of me today. I just know it. I can feel you in my bones. It's electric. The bonds that bind us together. You feel it too, right? Our special connection. Tell me you're thinking of me. Happy New Year. Hope to hear from you soon. Trevor. I put out the cigarette. I was tempted to burn myself with it. Wouldn't have been the first time. No. I said to myself, You're done with that shit. All of it. You haven't done stupid shit like that since you were a kid. But then, I hadn't smoked cigarettes in more than a year. And here I was, smoking. I hoped Mom wouldn't smell it. That was the last thing I needed. This is it, I thought, and repeated it to myself several times with my eyes shut tight. When I don't answer him on our anniversary, he'll get it. He'll take the point. This is it. This is it. For two months, I dared to hope that it was. February 27th, 2016. Dear Mercy, Have I done something to offend you, sweetheart? Why would you treat me this way? By now, I'm sure at least one of my letters has reached you. I've sent dozens, maybe more. Your whore of a mom couldn't have caught all of them. So why aren't you answering? I miss you. Your friend, Trevor. Into the drawer the letter went. Out came the textbooks. On came the computer. I breathed a sigh of relief as the machine booted up. Finally, he gets it. It was the best thing that could have happened. Better even than never hearing from him again. This time, for once, he acknowledged that I had deliberately cut him off. It took him long enough. As I commenced hacking my way through pages and pages of research on evolving theory on abnormal psychology, I felt an unexpected twinge of guilt. Trevor Walker was a criminal. A killer. But it had originally been me, not him, 
who had reached out for a friend. He hadn't even had the guts to tell him I was done. This could have been over long ago. And through it all, he'd cared enough about me to keep our letter secret. If he had told anyone, I knew, then sooner or later, everyone would have found out. I felt bad for him, but not bad enough to write back. I figured he had one more letter left in him, tops. But I was wrong. He had two. March 19th, 2016. Dear Mercy, In all the time we've been corresponding, you never once asked me what happened that night. I'm sure you must want to know. I can't blame you. I understand. Well, sweetheart, I think you deserve to know the true story. I owe you that much. It was 1986, and I was taking a stroll after dark. As I walked by the woods, I saw something strange, something I still can't properly describe to this day. In the darkness, I saw something even darker. Something that seemed to absorb even the dimmest of light. A kind of shadow in the shadows. I could only make out its presence from the absence of things around it. This strange moving shadow shifted towards me as though liquid and solid all at once. I was frozen in fear. Couldn't move. Couldn't run. Couldn't scream. The shadow slithered into me. And suddenly, I felt a rush of adrenaline. My body started moving on its own. You know, after all these years, I've always maintained my innocence. And this is why. I wasn't in control that night. I was just a puppet. That thing, that shadow, it pulled me by unseen strings, forced me to do those heinous things. I couldn't stop myself. There was no way to resist him. He made me steal that truck, made me throw those women into the back, made me force myself on them, made me watch as my hands squeezed the life out of them. I had to watch. Oh God, I had to watch as the light faded from their eyes and felt their bodies turn cold. I had to throw them into the ditch and hunt for the next. But after the third woman, I managed to restrain him. I sat on the hood of that truck and waited for the police to find and arrest me. That was my choice. What I did to those women wasn't. Now that you know the truth, will you respond to me? I miss you. Your friend, Trevor. This, I said aloud, looking the letter over again for a third time. This is out of control. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, this would be the moment when a normal person would say to herself, Hey, you know what? Your pen pal is a fucking lunatic who blames his psychoses on demonic possession and believes he just used you as his confessor. A normal person, an adult, would have understood that there was information in that letter that the police might want. And you'd be right to think that. Even if all the other letters leading up to this one could have been filed in a drawer labeled my own personal bullshit, I could not do that with this one. Not with a clean conscience. If I didn't turn that letter in, I might even be guilty of withholding or something. But Trevor Walker was still in jail. He'd been sentenced to life without the possibility of parole, and in this state, that actually means something. He was surrounded by brick and bars and razor wire and shotguns. If he tried anything, there wasn't a cop anywhere on earth that would hesitate. They'd blow his fucking brains out. And I was in too deep. I'd collected over 50 letters from this monster and done nothing with them. I'd be hounded everywhere I went. I'd have to move, change my identity, hit the reset button on my life yet again. I had friends. I was normal. Things weren't even that bad with mom anymore. So go ahead and say it. I won't argue. I was an idiot. I let the sleeping dog lie. It wasn't long, of course, before the sleeping dog woke up. July 2nd, 2016. Dear Mercy, 
I gave you a chance, Mercy. I gave you all the time in the world to reply to me. Why didn't you reply to me? Are you afraid of me? Don't you believe my story? Have you lost faith in me? In us? What they say in the news ain't right, you know. I grew up normal. A normal boy in a normal, God-fearing household in the outskirts of Montana. They tell my story the way they want to tell my story. Make things up to make me sound like some kind of bloodthirsty animal capable of nothing but inflicting pain. They never understood me. They changed my story to fit their agendas. To come up with a fake little explanation as to why I was the way I was because the lie made more sense than the truth I told. Made more sense than knowing that demons are out there. That the devil is real. That I was just a puppet. They said I tortured my pets as a kid. What a fucking crock. I never heard a damn animal in my life. Said I was a loner. Not true. I had plenty of friends. Not that any of them would admit to that now. But you would. You know how good of a friend I can be, Mercy. They made me out to be everything I wasn't. They spun their web of lies, made me out to be a monster. The joke's on them, though. I ain't no monster. I'm a savior. I'm rotting in this jail cell by choice. It's by my will and my will alone that this creature doesn't get back out into the world. I make sure that I stay in this cell right here where it can't escape. Don't you see? I let myself get caught on purpose. I wanted to protect the world, not from me, but from it. I keep the world safe. I keep you safe. But it wants out. I'm not sure I can hold it back anymore. You see, you and I, our strings have become intertwined. We're its puppets, entangled by fate. It wants to play with you. And I don't think I can fend it off any longer. I've protected you this long. But it wants out now, Mercy. It wants out. It wants you. I've read and reread your letters over and over again. You were very careful to leave your address out of our correspondences. Or maybe that was the jail. I don't know. All I know is that your letters always came in blank envelopes. But even though I received many blank envelopes, I always knew which were yours. I could smell yours, Mercy. They smelled like you, sweet like lavender. I sniffed them over and over until the scent dried out and was replaced by the stench of my jail cell. I think I look forward to that the most. Funny how much you underestimate scent until you wind up somewhere where everything smells the same. Yeah, you were careful. Or you tried to be. But you, or they, forgot one major detail. All the little things you've told me over the years that helped me track you down. The time you told me about the creek. The way you described your town. The terrain. Aren't you a sweetheart for giving me the name of your high school so I could track you down? Yeah, we know exactly where you live. See you soon, sweetheart. That was it. His last letter. He must have written it during the day, before mail call or whatever they call it on the inside, because that was also the night that he broke out. He'd been in maximum security, naturally. A thousand brick and mortar layers of you're fucked separating him from the rest of society. But he got out anyway alone. No tunnels, no bodies, nothing. By the time the letter arrived, I'd already been here for two days, along with mom. She's still trying to process all this. How could I have kept it a secret from her for so long? It's no secret that she doesn't think I'm all that clever. No more than you do. And I won't judge you for that. I've done what you've asked me to do. I've spent hours typing all this shit out. It's everything I can remember about my letters to Trevor and his letters to me. Hope it does some good. One of the hardest things for me to get my head around just now, as I sit at this computer at the clerk's office in the police station, 
is the realization that Trevor Walker was not my father's friend. The man in the picture with Dad was not the Trevor Walker I just saw on television. They're nothing alike. I suppose I should not be too surprised. Turns out the man in the photograph is some guy named Pete Duggar, and he'd been busted with my dad after the convenience store robbery. I now realize that when my father had written, getting to know wonderful people like Trevor Walker, I was being sarcastic. I mean, if they'd been so wonderful together, why would Trevor have killed him in the cafeteria that day? I suppose I should be grateful. I'm surrounded by more than half the cops in town and most of the other half are out looking for him. I'm as safe as I can be. But Trevor is out there looking too. Looking for me. I am certain he was truthful about that much. And that's not even the worst thing. That's not why I'm so scared. I know my mother and I will remain in protective custody for a good long time. Or until you catch him, and I hope you do. No, the thing that bothers me is the possibility that everything Trevor Walker said about his original crimes was actually the truth. I mean, impossible as that is, it sure would explain the jailbreak. And no one else seems to be able to do that. If people are so willing to believe in God without evidence, based only on faith, then how hard is it to imagine that the devil, or his agents, walk among us as well? If they do, you won't be able to save me. No one will. He'll probably kill my mother as well. And it will be my fault. Because I didn't help Trevor keep the devil at bay. Standardized school tests are a bitch, but you won't believe the consequences of failure if you are a second rounder. And now for your listening pleasure, perhaps, I bring you Standard Deviations by Marcus Demanda. The test is God. I can see them in the corner screen of my monitor. My students, all 110 of them, packed alphabetically by last name into 11 rows of laptop computer screens in the testing center. A police officer stands at every row. They prowl. They proctor. That used to be my job back when I first got into education. Teachers administered their own tests but such a thing would be unthinkable now. Crazy talk. A hand goes up and a cop delivers scratch paper. Another hand goes up. Tissues this time. There's been an unusual amount of pollen this year. Allergies are out of control. But this kid, Marjorie, is just crying. These are the second rounders. They've all been through remediation. I'm their second chance teacher, promoted because of my success in mainstream classrooms. I was good. I was too good. Now I'm here. I open up the progress tracker on the far left of the screen. I find her name. She's 35 questions in, 15 to go. She's missed 10 so far. She's right on the line. She might fail. There is no way for her to really know this. She can't track her progress like I can. But she knows anyway. I'm alone in the observation chamber. These are my kids. No one else's. My test. And it's cold in here. That's for the equipment, I'm told, and not just the computers. There's a lot of data storage in this room, all locked behind steel cabinets. And then there are the refrigerators, a whole wall of them. Inside these, 
there are rewards. If everything goes well, I'll get to distribute them later. A boy named Jamie finishes and closes his laptop. Score, 512. Pass advance. Good for him. He'll move up. He's shown progress. Good for me. I need to fall within a reasonable range of the average for my results to be considered effective. Of course, if the needle points far enough to the right, I'm a teacher, rock star, and a hero. But if my scores drift too far to the left of the standard deviation, adjustments will be made. My status could change to monitor for years. I could be replaced. They won't simply return me to my old classroom and let me do what I was born to do. Teachers move up and down, in and out, same as the kids. No one stays in one place for long. It's all about progress. It's about growth or correction. Lizzie finishes and closes her laptop, even as Jamie allows himself to be led from the center by one of the cops. This, too, is standard. He won't know his score until they're all done. He'll wait in one of two rooms. He passes Lizzie but makes no sign. His lips remain tightly shut, his eyes focused straight ahead as the cop grips his elbow, ushering him out. Lizzie's score is 600. Perfect. She's been hunting and pecking for three solid hours. She, too, is led from the room when the escort officer returns. His expression is utterly inscrutable. He is well-trained. Lizzie's gait is characterized by a slight weary stagger, but she seems relieved to be led through the same door as Jamie. Smart kids, even the second-rounders, figure out things quickly. Ten minutes later, Brenda is the first kid to fail the test. 398. She doesn't know it yet as she presses the laptop shut with a soft click, but in spite of her score on these last two tests, she's got enough common sense to know it's probably a bad thing when she's ushered toward the other room, the one Jamie and Lizzie weren't waiting in. Not definitely, but probably. She cries, passing through, but that's all. Later, when it's obvious to everyone which door is which, kids will have to be dragged through that second door. There might even be fighting. I've seen it before. Two passes, both advanced, and one failure. 66.6% success rate. I don't get any extra credit for pass advance or even perfect scores. All that matters is the pass-fail ratio. And 66.6% .6 is not good. It's far to the left of standard deviation. I hope the other 107 kids are taking their time, doing their best work. Didn't always used to be like this. Don't get me wrong, it's not like anyone gets killed over test scores. Not really. But my little hometown in Northern Virginia really has seen a boost in student performance since it agreed to pilot this program two years ago. It operates under the premise that all children can learn, and who could argue with that? Certainly not me. I was a rising figure when I met the program administrator and remediation coordinator, Dr. Quarterman. I'd been recommended toward administration courses. Not me, though. Becoming an assistant principal, or worse yet, a principal, would flood my day with every aspect of the job I hated. Paperwork, discipline, budgeting and it would take me from what I love most, the classroom. I should have done it, though. I really should have. We all have things we'd do over, I guess. Dr. Quarterman explained the program to me when I was reassigned to the second rounders. The idea of failure not being an option is not just a phrase anymore, he said. We take it quite literally, and that distinguishes us from other programs. If a child should fail, that child should be retrained, remotivated, retested. Marjorie has ten questions to go. I've always liked her. She's such an inquisitive child. She wants to do well. 
It's intrinsic for her. She wants to please the adults in her life, particularly me. She's a joy to have in the classroom, in spite of her difficulties. Surgery was supposed to have corrected her particular form of dyslexia, which consisted mainly of letter and number reversal. She has a permanent implant for control of her attention deficit, too. There's no reason to think she wouldn't have mastered the material by now. Unless the surgeon had slipped or something. She wipes sweat from her forehead. A cop brings her more tissues. She answers another question. Another miss. She's going to have to finish strong. I say a prayer for her. She deserves to succeed. As for the others, half of them are done. My students are now at an 88% pass rate, much better than when only three had finished, and also a good enough number to be counted as effective only last year. But we believe in progress in this little hometown of mine, and this year, I need to get to 90% to fall within the acceptable norms. There hasn't been any fighting yet, no dragging. Maybe it won't happen. Outside, the parking lot is full. Two floors down, in the lobby, 200 or so mothers and fathers wait. A certain percentage of them will soon have reason to celebrate. A large majority of them, in fact. If things go well, they'll find me available, and I'll be invited to more parties than I can possibly attend. Not that I would go to any of them. I tend to dwell on the failures. It's just the kind of guy I am. Last year, things went so well. So said the data, anyway. They called me a miracle worker. They let me open the cryogenic refrigerators and present the kids with their rewards. It would be straight to the hospital for them after that. No big deal. Reattachments were made in no time. Within hours, they were home, all 88% of them, eating their favorite foods and opening presents with their friends. I heard that Dr. Quarterman made the rounds, congratulating them. When the rest of the kids are done here today, I'll be able to return Jamie's teeth to him. Lizzie will get back both of her fingers. The refrigerators contain a wide variety of incentives. They're all carefully labeled. I sit. I wait. Another hour passes. No lunch is served. The remaining kids work and work and work. I doubt they're hungry anyway. I'm sure as hell not hungry. And in the end, it's only Marjorie. She's the very last of them. Her percentage is at the leftmost edge of standard deviation, and she has just one question left to answer. The correct answer is C. I have the answer key right in front of me. Choose C. I try to project to her in my mind. Come on, kid. Choose C. C. When in doubt, that's what you're always supposed to choose, right? My personal effectiveness score now rests at 89%, 1% higher than it's ever been, and yet one little question away from... Well, to be honest, I don't know. They never tell that kind of thing. We know the incentives in advance, but they don't advertise the consequences. She adjusts her monocle blinks away sweat. She's testing for the return of her left eyeball, which is the most nearsighted one. If she gets it back, they'll even fix it for her. Marjorie uses her scratch paper. She takes her time. She does her best. Maybe they'll just change my assignment. I dare to hope. They won't hurt me. I'm worth too much to them. Her finger hovers over the keyboard, shaking, and at last, she picks one. She answers the question. I pray they'll go easier on her this time. The last of the police officers disperse. It's all over. A couple of them, I know, will be headed my way. Oh well, I tell myself. I'm tired of teaching first grade anyway.
I hope you enjoyed tonight's tales, Aren't You a Sweetheart? and Standard Deviations, both written by Marcus Demanda. Marcus Demanda, writer, teacher, world's best uncle, adoptive dad to Shazam the Cat, is the gatekeeper to your nightmares and dreams, weaver of tales fantastic and unimaginable, or some stuff like that. More of his work can be found at velux.com, that's V-E-L-O-X.com, as well as on the No Sleep Podcast, where he has been a core writer for years. A special shout out to the fine folks at Velox for making tonight's stories available to us. Voice acting assistance from the talented Olivia Steele. Born and raised in Northern California, Olivia Steele began her passionate pursuit of the arts at a very young age, surrounded by films, music, and books. Lots and lots of books, a good number of which were Nancy Drew mysteries. Over the years, she's written, though not published, a wide variety of stories and has brought that creative imagination into her work as a voiceover artist. Olivia kind of stumbled into voiceover through an odd turn of events, starting with her fifth grade self-discovering a point-and-click Nancy Drew game about a spooky mansion at a school book fair, to a late-night conversation with a friend at camp talking about scary games, to discovering playthroughs of scary games on YouTube when she finally picked up her first 3D game and got stuck, and then finally coming across the world of YouTube voiceover. Since those days, Olivia has grown, leaving behind the simple world of YouTube auditions and now works predominantly with the indie developer community, not only providing voices, but helping to locate other actors for roles meant for them. You can follow Olivia Steele on Twitter, at Aurora Guinevere. That's A-U-R-O-R-A-G-U-I-N-I-V-E-R-E. Or on YouTube, Scarily Olivia. S-C-A-R-I-L-Y-O-L-I-V-I-A or go to her website www.oliviasteel.net That's O-L-I-V-I-A-S-T-E-E-L-E dot net If you enjoyed tonight's story, hosted by yours truly, Paul J. McSorley, you can search my name on Chilling Tales for Dark Nights on YouTube for additional previous stories. If you'd like to hear more lengthy tales, be sure to take a look at my audiobooks. Available now on audible.com or just visit paulsbooks.net. That's P A U L S B O O K S dot net. You can also find me personally on Facebook and Twitter. And with that, listeners, our weekly journey into the psyche has just about come to a close. But before we go, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for joining us for tonight's episode and remind you to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chilling Tales for Dark Nights a five-star review and a kind word. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram if you haven't already. And while you're at it, please remember to stop by our Apple Podcast page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and subscribe. The charts are based on subscriptions, not listens. So if you haven't subscribed yet, I'd really appreciate it. I'm your host for Fear from the Heartland, Paul J. McSorley. I've enjoyed the titillation tonight. Ooh, there's that word again. Thank you for joining me. Hope to see you again next week at Fear from the Heartland. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.